Hi, I can see that the room is filling up, and so why don't we get underway? My name is Celine Coggins. I'm the Executive Director of Grantmakers for Education. Uh, so glad that you're joining us today to talk about uh, local community foundations and the local response uh, to COVID-19 and how can we learn and how are we collaborating. Uh, as you all know, GFE is a national organization and um, we've been having lots of conversations about the coronavirus crisis and its implications on education. But every time we have one of those conversations, it's very clear that the response that's happening uh, among those in the philanthropic community is a local response, that the challenges that we're facing are local challenges. And, uh, and so what we wanted to do today is bring folks together for um, a highly interactive conversation. Um, I asked some friends from Denver, uh, so Janet Lopez at the Rose Community Foundation and Kalinas Newsom and uh, Julie Patino at the Denver Foundation to kind of help us spark the conversation. They're in a learning process. Um, they're brilliant people, but they don't have all of the answers. Um, what we want to do is um, be able to share across different localities. So we know there are folks on this call from New York and from Boston and from the West Coast and I think from Seattle. Um, when we did the prep call with the folks from Denver, they were talking about how we've learned from Seattle in terms of collaboration, in terms of what to do. And so I'm going to ask these guys to kind of tee up a conversation. We're going to frequently turn it to uh, others on the line and ask you questions. I encourage everyone on the line to put uh, their questions in the chat. Feel free to unmute yourself when you have a question. Feel free to keep yourself muted <laughs> uh, when you don't have a question. Uh, and uh, you know, I just want to say what I like to say at the beginning of all of these is um, we all have furry friends, we all have teenage friends or baby friends. I've even seen some in there already. Um, those are all welcome. <laughs> And that is the world we inhabit these days. Uh, so I wanted to start by just um, offering to uh, Janet, Kalinas, and Julie um, to just introduce yourselves, say a couple of words about uh, the work that you do and the work that you're doing right now, uh, and then we'll move to questions. Maybe Janet go first? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. This is Janet Lopez from Rose Community Foundation, and it's so good to see I see many of my Denver and Colorado funder friends, so thanks. And so great to also see people from across the country, but glad that I also have, I know there's a lot of Colorado collective expertise beyond Kalinas and Julie and I. Um, so Rose is a community foundation for those of you that aren't familiar with our foundation. We are turning 25, uh, we're 25 years old this year. And um, we were started from, uh, originally from the sale of a Jewish community hospital. And the, the sort of, the folks who started the foundation made a very intentional decision to actually um, become a community foundation, which, uh, you know, I think is interesting to this conversation in terms of beyond the grant making, um, all the tools that we have sort of at this moment that are at our disposal, which is, I'm interested to hear that conversation. Um, we are mostly a Metro Denver funder, but we have also historically gotten involved when we can make a case that statewide work, that's often policy work, um, is going to impact Metro Denver. We also have done grant making in that area. I have been the senior program officer for um, the last eight years in the education portfolio. And in terms of sort of what we are doing right now, we um, on Tuesday, we announced a slate of grants um, that equaled $1.5 million. Um, there's about 120 different grants, including um, uh, sort of to uh, across a lot of different organizations. The state of Colorado has started a um, similar sort of, uh, to Celine's comments about sort of the Seattle context, uh, the governor has started his own relief fund that we made a significant contribution and then most of the rest of our grant making was in Metro Denver. But we really tried to apply an equity lens um, just to kind of share with you the, the kind of categories and the focus as we thought about who had the most need. Um, we were really focused on basic needs, emergency needs, and trying to think about um, a, a set of sort of communities and populations. Um, we looked at older adults. We looked at immigrants and refugees. 
the medically vulnerable, we looked at sort of um, those we were worried about in terms of domestic violence issues at home, the food insecure, um, homeless and housing insecure, and um, and then specific to sort of the education, I'm happy to get into that. We looked at sort of the needs um, of the, there are about nine different school districts across Metro Denver and tried to look at what need was there, which I'm sure we'll jump into later. And um, the last thing that I'll just sort of say in my introduction is we really tried to think about this. Um, we, we had a board meeting last week where our board really decided that um, the rest of our work probably for the rest of this year is going to be COVID related. And so we've been thinking about what was announced on Tuesday was our sort of first stab at in those like emergency basic needs and that that it will sort of this that was one of what we anticipate is at least three stages for us. The second stage we think of grant making will be about um, midterm and sort of long term impact to, to the nonprofit community in general and and specifically I'm happy to share about sort of the thinking about that in the education community more broadly. And then the third um, stage for us we hope will be recovery efforts. So I'll stop there, but that's sort of a general overview of what we have we've been thinking about it and what we've done so far. That's a great start. Thanks so much. Denver Foundation. So I'm gonna go ahead. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start because I think um, I, I really want you all to hear from my colleague Julie Patino, who is um, really leading a huge portion of our response to um, COVID-19 here in the metro area. Um, my name is Kalinas Newsom. I'm the director of education at the Denver Foundation until April 24th, um, and then I'm headed to the Colorado Health Foundation um, to lead their school-based solutions work. So I'm really excited about that. Um, we have, uh, to Janet's point, I think, have uh, in the last few weeks have uh, really been cranking out um, lots of grants. We're in, in the midst of several different processes um, happening right now. One is our community grants program um, and organizations that um, are, are sort of applied for those um, grants, um, some of which we've expedited because of their work on the ground um, in response to COVID-19. Um, and then we are also in the midst of our critical needs fund, which I'll let Julie um, talk a little bit more about because she's been really critical to um, the Denver Foundation's work um, in, the, in the immediate um, term as it relates to um, providing for the basic human needs of our most vulnerable population here in, uh, in the metro area. Um, the Denver Foundation is the largest community foundation in the Mountain West region. Um, we are almost 100 years old, I think, almost, we're almost there. Um, we have, um, we're a traditional community foundation we have our donor advised funds, and then we have our the sort of nonprofit side of the house. Um, we have four program areas uh, that we do a, a large bucket of our grant making out of. That's basic human needs, economic opportunity, education, and leadership and equity. Um, we do all of our grant making through a racial equity lens um, at the Denver Foundation. As a matter of fact, it's it's critically important um, to the work that we do and how we're responding to COVID nineteen. Um, in our education portfolio specifically, um, we have done less basic human needs work. Um, we've really let, that, let, let Julie kind of um, handle that and more focusing in on organizations that are doing um, direct services for kids and families who might not actually have access to um, some of the resources that, that many other um, members of our community have access to. Um, we've done a fair amount of grants to organizations that are uh, working to pull their their work online um, and that I think has been um, really important especially for students who might not have uh, remote access or opportunities to have a Chromebook for example I got an email today about um, one of our partners um, looking to uh, provide Chromebooks um, in far northeast because there's a there's a shortage of um, Chromebooks so not sure exactly how to respond to that, but those are the types of things that are coming to us on a regular basis. Um, one of the things that I think is really important for us um, as we think about recovery, because I think we're definitely on the recovery side of looking at the recovery side of things as well, is you know we do a large portion of our funding um, you know for organizations that are led by and serving folks of color. 
And um, we have had many conversations about those organizations um, and their ability to exist after all of this. Um, and so, you know, we're really thinking deeply about how we will um, continue to do our own grant making um, in the midst of, of um, COVID-19, but also looking at those organizations that are doing deep work that might not be here when this is all said and done. So I'm gonna turn it over to Julie um, and have her talk a little bit more about herself and her work at the foundation and um, some of the things that she's doing to lead the, um, really, I think the, the uh, food and housing insecurity work that's happening in our city. Thanks, Kalinas, and thank you, education grant makers, for allowing me to be an interloper. <laughs> um, again, my name is Julie Patino, and I have a funny job title, which is more relevant than it's probably ever been, but it's the Director of Basic Human Needs. And essentially, that really has um, traditionally covered homelessness, housing insecurity, food insecurity, protection from domestic violence, really with a strong emphasis on organizations that have interventions around women of color, people of color, um, and immigrant and refugee populations. And then that same lens applied to access to basic health care, really looking at folks who are uninsured or uninsurable, so undock folks. And then the other um, overarching lens is really one of kind of legal advocacy. Um, that's my background is as a, a legal aid litigator and lawyer. Um, and so that affects all of those areas that I mentioned. Normally, when I talk to organizations about applying for grants through my portfolio, I emphasize that I am not talking about emergency services that we would normally describe as sort of one off. I'm really talking about integrated poverty work that has very explicit understanding of the layers of not only poverty, but race, um, kind of wraparound services, one-stop shopping. I am now, during this time, speaking out of the other side of my mouth, and that is really recognizing that organizations that I have not funded before because they were, um, at that time, kind of siloed in a particular area and just doing, let's say, um, providing shelter beds. Um, I was really heavily focused on organizations that were participating in homeless response systems in a holistic way and really trying to move people into permanent housing. And I find myself um, really moving into supporting some of those other organizations. Um, the first, I'm, I'm proud to say that I think we might have been one of the earliest deployment of grants. Um, we had our grantees identified on March 13th and grants out by that following Monday. Um, and really that's a testament not only to kind of a community foundation, but I also think it's a testament to our relationships with our grantees that they immediately, when I'm contacting them in the second week of March, we're picking up the phone, responding to um, emails immediately. Um, we specifically chose what I called umbrella organizations, and that was organizations that were really in a kind of the head of a sector, so to speak. So for instance, we have an organization called the Center for Health Equity, which um, convenes all of the uh, healthcare organizations that are either part of federally qualified health centers or part of non-federally qualified health centers, which is where we see a lot of our folk of color um, going to get their health care. Um, and they were a convener. And so we were able to tap into them knowing they could immediately tell us what was happening on the field and on the ground because of their relationships. But they would also have some latitude to be able to move resources and assess the greatest need really quickly. I will mention that um, pretty much all of the areas that I've explained uh, have an intersectionality, obviously with um, families and children experiencing homelessness or um, have other vulnerabilities. So even the healthcare centers, some of those are embedded in schools. Um, I did a deployment of grants to the family resource centers around the state. Um, again, using the Family Resource Center Association to serve as the hub and that is predominantly where families who are um, insecure in a number of those areas um, typically go, but I knew would be overwhelmed. They too have embedded um, programming around you know, early childhood education, educational programs run through those family resource centers. So I, would, I knew I was gonna be able to capture those folks as well. 
I guess the other flavor kind of of our work at this time too is I'm serving on um, three statewide task force, two that make total sense. You know, one is a homeless statewide homeless task force and the other one is on feeding and hunger. The other one is literally on the state's disaster and emergency relief, which involves all of those entities and education, all these different pieces. But it's been a really interesting learning curve to see what um, statewide disaster deployment and um, infrastructure looks like. And frankly, I think we, um, our sectors have a lot to learn <laughs> um, from that because to me, the, the beautiful that thing that's coming out of it is really a meshing of all of these sectors that normally don't work and play well together, really coming together and having to solve for their communities multitude of needs. So it's actually a pretty, um, you know, it's a pretty propitious moment really um, that we are sitting on um, that it will be interesting to see if we're able to retain that as we go forward. That's helpful. All right, I'm going to practice uh, 10 seconds or so, the most I can muster of wait time to see if anyone wants to jump in with a question. I have a million already. Um, <clears throat> also, I want to encourage people to throw questions into the chat box. Okay, even as a teacher, I was terrible at wait time. <laughs> uh, so, so let me just ask uh, one of you, to talk a little bit more about the relationship uh, with the state government. So um, you touched on it a couple of different ways. Number one is a governor's response fund that was starting early on, um, another, another of these task forces. Um, any lessons that have come out of this work so far with government? Any lessons? Um, I believe that the governor's uh, fund was the first fund to roll out, or one of the first funds to roll out in a big way statewide. Um, any things that you saw that were lessons in that first stage or anything more to say about the relationship to government? I would say, um, you know, and I, I'm going to also just make sure I provide space for Julie and um, Janet, but the the calls that I have been on with the, the bulk of um, Colorado philanthropy I've been really um, pleased to see the level of coordination um, and the governor's fund is a, a, a great example of that. Uh, I think all of our foundations have given to that fund. Um, and we are, on, at the Denver Foundation, we have um, someone on our team, our director of leadership and equity, who is actually um, reviewing proposals um, for that fund. So that I think is um, a testament to our ability to kind of mobilize and coordinate. I will say that, um, you know, I think the, the challenge is there are so many competing um, interests and um, desires for, you know, for folks to kind of make sure they, they, they also have um, their own um, priorities centered in that work. Um, you know, for us at the foundation, having our um, director of leadership and equity on that team or a team of folks that are reviewing that grant um, really is, I think, um, incredibly important in, in making sure that we get those resources out to the most vulnerable people in our population. Um, and there's always that, that tension about how we define vulnerability, what it looks like, who's eligible, who's not. Um, and then I think our own foundations have responded, right? So Janet talked a lot about what Rose has done. We have our critical needs fund. Um, so you're seeing a lot of that as well. Um, so I would say that, you know, there are lots of resources that are being mobilized and coordinated. I've been really excited about that. But I think, you know, moving forward, it's really going to be about how do we sustain this work and how do we really plan for the eventual recovery? Um, those conversations have not happened yet. Yeah. I would um, just a couple things. One, I think one thing to point out is other people you know, think about, you know, the focus, the, you know, all of the foundations, I think, you know, one, one thing to kind of, you know, air like, you know, walking the walk um, is that, you know, our, our state fund got stood up right away, said it was super focused on equity, and then had no translation into, you know, even Spanish in terms of people mm -hmm. applying. And luckily, you know, many people pushed back on that. And then pretty quickly, that was, um, 
that was changed. But I think, you know, as we think about saying we're committed to equity with these, you know, big sort of beasts in terms of the big state funds and then sort of being able to then have individuals and leaders in the foundation community put push on the systems to actually sort of, you know, walk the talk. Um, and uh, there, um, right now, that particular fund, I see a question in the chat box and I can just answer it. That fund is not, um, to my knowledge, and I know we also have, um, I see that Erica Church, I know, is one of the people on who, who's on, on this call and she might also be able to provide some perspective. Um, there's a question about it, whether it's open to individuals. And right now, to my understanding, it's um, there are $25,000 grants and they are going to organizations themselves. So, um, and so would share that. I think the second thing I would share is just that as we think about the state and the role of like our partnerships with the state and whether or not our foundations, I think, believe in actually making, contributing and doing grant making to government. Um, and, you know, some groups do and some groups don't. We've been a foundation that feels comfortable with that and feel like we've spurred a lot of innovation and efficiency by doing grant making. But it, it you know, in no surprise, it, what we've seen is that, um, you know, the in inequities in the system existed and they're sort of exacerbated and highlighted and held up in a more, even brighter light. So, for example, um, one of the investments that we made um, as we I had conversations with all the immigrant and refugee serving organizations was um, that translation in languages beyond just, you know, maybe the top five or 10 languages, it really wasn't getting done. And so when we had those conversations with the state, you know, we realized, you know, there was no budget, there was not a sufficient budget at the state. And so they'd eaten through their entire translation budget. And then you have to make a decision about like, well, should the state, you know, the state should pay for this, they aren't paying for this. And are we going to are we going to do it in the, are we going to step up in this moment and say we're making a contribution or are we going to say, no, we really think that's the state's responsibility. And so, you know, those are interesting tensions as we also think about nonprofit partners. And for us, the solution for us, which we were pretty excited about was to make, um, we made sort of a nonprofit partner that has incredible translation um, capacity, the Spring Institute, the grantee recipient and their translators are now translating. They, they were approved to translate, you know, a thousand, a thousand pages of documents for state and city governments to be available to them. So we feel like it's a win-win, but definitely those are, again, you know, system level gaps are just even more exacerbated in this moment. Really helpful and really specific. I'm going to have Julie jump in in one second, but I do want to, because the purpose of this call is to kind of learn across, um, I did want to just kind of um, jump in from the chat box that uh, so the New Jersey statewide relief fund was launched by the first lady, but it's managed by a community found the community foundation of New Jersey. So it's separate from government. So, you know, there are lots of different ways that this is playing out. I hope that we're able to highlight lots of them. So, uh, but with that, I do want to pull back to Julie and say uh, any, anything you wanted to say on this topic of collaboration with government and, uh, and, and all that. Well, I, I guess I have three things to say. One is, um, I think collaboration's great, but I also feel, particularly if your organization has a really strong equity lens, and I'm gonna use really loaded language right now, and I mean to, we need to keep our eyes on the prize. And that is not rely on these large funds to have the, um, the notion of trickle down to the most impacted folks. And so, for ourselves, we're, we're playing in, you know, that collaborative space. Of course, you know, we should, but we are also holding really tightly to our own values and our own grant making um, in ways that we can control the folks that on the best of days get left out and resources don't trickle down to. So I think um, being able to play in that space is good holding tight to sort of your own values and your own ability to have a locus of control where you can um, deploy those resources to the most impacted communities in ways that um, you can control the criteria and the chaos is important. And then I think the other thing is, I, you know, it's the lawyer and me, but infiltrate. So the fact that we have our director of uh, racial equity and community leadership in that space 
it's really important to have those voices from impacted communities able to really continue to keep um, beating that drum because what I'm finding is that we're in a world of amorphousness. So right now, everybody is saying they're housing insecure. Everybody is saying they're food insecure. When we do those sort of things, we really dilute kind of these um, discernment processes in ways that I think are highly impactful um, to communities that are already impacted on a good day. So those are, that's my three cents. <laughs> So I want to pick up on a question from the chat box. Uh, how do you balance funding smaller nonprofits doing good work? And this might pick up on the topic that you all mentioned before, smaller organizations, newer organizations led by leaders of color uh, versus bigger, more stable nonprofits while, while not knowing if the smaller ones are going to be around. I think, uh, I mean, that's a, I think that's a, that is like, that's the, that's the question. <laughs> um, I mean, I think that's a huge question. I think that we, in some cases with our grant making, we try to, in, in some of the areas that I talked about, we were able to find, I think, a larger intermediary that we felt like was very stable, could get the dollars across the way. And then there were some areas where that, that entity didn't exist. And so, um, ultimately, at the end of the day, for this first round of emergency and basic needs, we said, who do we know can get this? And we, ha you know, and a lot of it was either relationship driven or we had heard, we knew from enough people that they were doing the work on the ground and were getting, the, you know, our dollars to people immediately to have that sort of, and, and we really did say, like, we didn't ask actually for I mean, all of our grants, essentially, we had conversations over the set of about two weeks, and then we made the grants. We actually didn't ask for anything like we typically do in terms of fi the financials. So a lot of it was either we know these organizations are stable, stable or, you know, have had stability, and two, we, we know that, or we don't, this is a new organization to us, but we know they're doing really good work because we've heard from enough people and seen the work they're doing. But um, it definitely, I think, as we think about um, the next two stages for us are trying to concentrate on that question of how do we make sure that these organizations are still here <laughs> um, and still exist at the at the end of the day. And I think to Kalinas's point, um, we definitely an eye on equity and worrying the most about um, small smaller organizations that were already running on shoestring budgets and led by. Um, in most cases in our city, that is often um, leaders of color. That's helpful. Julia, yeah. I saw you write, embrace alleged risk. You yeah. all have done yeah. before. Yeah, I, I think, um, so I just want to go back to Daniela's point about um, organizations that are um, serving in, in communities that we know um, sort of the, the grass top nonprofits might not uh, it, it you know, for lack of a better word, might not actually get into those communities, which we we, we see on a fairly regular basis. I mean, it's unfortunate. Um, and so for us, it's it's really um, I think at the Denver Foundation, we really prioritize the relationships that we have with our nonprofits, and um, especially those that are led by um, you know folks of color. For example, we've had a, several of our nonprofit executive directors who've gone through. Um, our executive directors of color institute reach out and specifically ask for um, push in funding for some of the work that they're doing with the understanding that they that that they are incredibly vulnerable and so I think you know to Julie's point we have to be very um, we have to embrace what she calls the alleged risk right that um, you know what would happen if these organizations weren't serving um, you know or didn't exist anymore. And, and I think that that is a value that we hold at the foundation, um, but not not absent from what I think, you know, the entire sector across the metro area um, is concerned about. So, you know, we also have a small grants um, uh, program called Strengthening Neighborhoods, where we can get those dollars out into um, communities. Um, I've done, you know, grants to um, family organizations or parents who reach out and say, hey, we have a great idea, we want to push it. So we, we, we're able to get those dollars out um, fairly quickly. 
Um, and that has been a part of this work as well. Uh, but I think, I think Julie should probably also um, come in because these are, these are conversations that we have all the time um, at the Denver Foundation. And it, it, it's, it's a huge part of our, our value set overall. That's helpful. And before Julie hops in, I do want to point folks to the chat box. Uh, really good information about how the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado and the Northern New Jersey Community Foundation are addressing this question of um, how do we make sure the nonprofits that are most at risk are uh, getting dollars. Julie. Um, well, I guess the other thing I would say is, um, so Colleen has mentioned our Strength in Your Neighborhoods grant program, which is specifically for non-501c3s. But we have a really strong portfolio of the small um, POC-led and serving organizations. And I'd have to say that's probably where I'm spending most of my time on the phone is with those organizations because, I mean, don't underestimate the power of relational technical assistance right now, of connecting organizations. Again, there's so much systems disruption, and I don't say that in a negative way. I think there's really positive systems disruptions happening right now. Um, as I am connecting these small nonprofit leaders with one another, and frankly, one of them I just spent an hour with this morning on the phone, and he said, you know what? We've been trying to get a measly $7,500 that was just put out um, you know, for the government and all of us are struggling to get it, and we're all these little POC-led organizations. We decided to forget that. We're all coming together. We're creating our own pooled fund. We're going to challenge people to match it, and we've come up with a whole new sort of business model around it. So I think the ability to really connect um, some of these leaders, particularly across sectors with one another, has proven really powerful. Um, and I think impacted communities, you know, uh, in Spanish, we have this term called rascuache, which is basically kind of a form of ingenuity. You know what I'm talking about, Janet? <laughs> um, and I feel like there's a lot of that taking place right now that we can tap into, lean into, or help even facilitate um, people connecting with one another. But I also just think reframing what we consider to be risky or not risky, um, you know, I, I just, you have to throw yourself in there sometimes and take those risks. I think that's helpful. Um, so on this topic of ingenuity, I'd love for you to all talk about the process of grant making right now. Um, how are you expediting proposal processes? How are you potentially, I, I heard uh, Kalina's mentioned uh, one of your team members working with the governor's fund to help them review proposals. Um, are these cumbersome processes? Are these expedited processes? Uh, what are the expectations on the back end? Is it, uh, you know, just open-ended operational support, support that has to flow through? How are you thinking about grant making in this moment? Um, so I can just share real quickly and then, um, I would love, I'm, I'm going to out her again because I know Erica's on, on, the, on the, she's on this call and she's on the governor's, she's on the governor's, which I, it was an amazing, the email about it was like the time commitment was, uh, you had to, you know, you, you would have to be probably excused from other parts of your job because they're really, they're meeting, the, so I'll let Erica, hopefully she'll, I hope she'll chime in a little bit, but for us, we, um, as I said, we didn't ask anybody in this round to, um, there was no application. They just, you know, got a phone call saying you're receiving this funding. The, um, we also discussed, um, you know, we discussed the length of these grants because we know some people, we made, some of them were very, they were very, some of them were very small grants that probably will get spent in a week. Some of them were really large grants that, you know, maybe it'll be a few months. We made our grant term six months and said, you know, we assume actually you're probably going to use this in a lot shorter period than six months, but we, you know, we wanted to have some chunk of time. We also, um, and then we essentially said to folks in terms of final, we, we usually have a final report that's written and submitted where you're talking about up against your out, you know, the sort of activities and the outcomes and the outputs and, you know, all the goals that, that you are reporting on. And we essentially also said in our letter, we were very intentional to say, um, when you finish, you can sort of let us know. And we basically have said you can um, you can have a phone call with us to report on what you did. You can fill out a survey to tell us what you did. We can have an, you know, sort of 
a video chat. We made it very flexible. Um, we do want to know what they do because our communications office wants to be able to communicate the amazing work that has happened and also to be able to communicate with our donors about the incredible work going on, but we made it incredibly flexible. So I, I, I'll be interested and we haven't really, we literally just got our dollars out the door to see if for the midterm and long-term impact grants and sort of the level two, you know, stage two and stage three for us, if we decide to do something different or to say again, that this is a very um, open and fluid process and easy process. Erica, I want to invite you, if you'd like to, to say a little bit more about the process, how you're learning from community foundations and enlisting that kind of community-based knowledge. If you don't want to, I will let you off the hook. No, I'm happy to. I'm happy to. Um, so the Governor's Fund, um, I, I would categorize it as being um, very mindful of people's time, of a rapid response. Um, so as Janet was describing, you know, when I when I volunteered to be a reviewer, um, it was a big ask because we're literally getting um, about 50 grants each. And there's, I think, like 20 reviewers. And we have two days to review the 50 grants applications and get back to folks. And then the checks go out the next week. And that will keep repeating itself every two weeks as long as there's funds. And so right now we're focused on um, prevention and impact, um, immediate needs, and then there'll be a midterm need and a recovery um, need. Um, one of the concerns I have is there's 8 million in the fund right now. And for as many organizations that are applying, for $25,000 grants, the fund's gonna go really fast. Um, I think we're only spending half this first round, um, but even four million is kind of a, just a drop in the bucket for what we're seeing um, that folks need. But still, it's still amazing and it's still, um, you know, a great fund and I also wanted to speak to the equity piece. You can tell that there was definitely uh, strong voices for equity because the point system we're using, um, you get more points if your um, organization or business is serving communities of color, um, people with disabilities, people without health insurance, people with limited English proficiency, and then you get even more points if you can hit multiple, you know, if you're serving, you know, if you're having a sort of integrative approach and you're serving, um, you know, communities that are experiencing multiple uh, issues. So I appreciate that. Um, and then there was a strong voice to fund financially vulnerable community-based organizations versus some of these larger nonprofits or businesses that are probably getting donations anyways. Um, people experiencing homelessness, people who cannot access health care, um, and then child care for health workers. So it's been really interesting to see um, what's come in. And I think, you know, not surprisingly, the groups that are rising to the top you know, are groups that are like small health related clinics um, that are serving uninsured folks. And what's been really sad and, and disturbing to me is a lot of these groups simply need PPE, protective personal equipment. And the US, you know, we have a nationwide crisis for masks and gloves and, and, um, you know, sterilizer, and it just makes me insane that, you know, while folks are trying to feed their communities, they're putting their own health at risk for not having something as simple as a mask. Um, so that's been pretty shocking to me. And my feedback to the group was, you know, why are all these groups, all of these groups should be, you know, asking for grants to keep doing what they're doing not grants for PPE. And so I'm hoping that we can take that off their, their, you know, 
have a statewide effort to just fund that versus all these tiny nonprofits applying. It seems crazy to me. Um, and the application's short. I think it's like maybe 10 questions. Um, the What's really nice is us grant reviewers, um, there's already been a process where there's been a community voice that has sort of driven these, you know, um, focus areas and the issues. And then there's, um, you know, a financial group. So by the time we get the grant, they've already vetted, um, they've already vetted them. Okay. So it's really just a matter of them fo then focusing on um, who are the most vulnerable in society. Um, so I, I, I'm pretty impressed by it. It's so far it's worked. I feel like it's been working pretty well. Um, I, I did have a question, um, and it might be you, Erica, or it might be um, some of the others on the line. If there is a rubric for how those state grants are being given out, maybe if you all would follow up with us and we could get it out to this little crowd, if that's possible. If it's not, that's fine. Um, Kalina, yeah. is there really anything about uh, this kind of innovation and grant making, trying to be um, more fast, more flexible, any, any lessons learned? Sorry, was that to me, Erica? Uh, well, I, I think you got a chance. I wanted to see if Kalina or Julie had yeah. a chance. Sorry, my, my Zoom. <laughs> totally fine. Thank you for being put on the spot. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, I guess the, the only thing I would add is that um, one of the things when we first did our first deployment of grants, um, working with those, I call them kind of umbrella organizations that had a lot of our smaller organizations sort of under them, is um, almost without exception, we kind of concocted a quick needs assessment. This happened before everyone is now in needs assessment fatigue, but um, it happened kind of on the early end. And so the questions that we use to gauge kind of deployment of those initial resources across an entire um, spectrum, so in other words, all the family resource centers, um, all the organizations serving people experiencing homelessness who are like over 100 organizations, um, and which had the highest response rates you could ever hope for. You know, we never get response rates like that. Um, those questions. Are others seem really kind of fake. I'm sorry. Um, but those questions that um, were posed in those early, um, you know, kind of needs assessments are ones that we have parlayed into asking as our grant questions right now, too. Um, so that, that was a helpful, um, you know, like they're simple, they're to the point, um, and they're real time. In our regular uh, community grants process, um, we, we have a process where we can expedite grants that are, um, you, know, you know, organizations that we know and are familiar with. Um, this go around, we took a look at, at, at the organizations that we knew were doing direct services. Um, and, and um, we, you know, organizations that we knew for sure um, would need those resources immediately. Um, and so we spent probably the last, I'd say, four or five days getting those dollars out of the door as quickly as possible, um, which means that we're, we're sort of doing um, double duty. Uh, but I will say that our, our reporting structure um, will remain the same. Um, we're, you know, we've really limited our, our, our application process. So the next go around um, organization's final report will actually serve as the application as opposed to having to go through this long, arduous process. Um, but I think, you know, again, um, we use, to Julie's point, we, we do have a, an internal rubric that gives us some sense of the organization's health overall. And we also have what we call an equity scorecard, for lack, for lack of a better word, that allows us to get some sense of where the organization is on the equity continuum. It doesn't necessarily exclude an organization from receiving funding, but it definitely does um, give us some information about um, what challenges organizations might have in that racial equity space and if, if there are opportunities where we can provide um, technical assistance for them to, to boost that. But that's part of our broader community grants program. My guess is that when we start to get in some, some data of, um, of the on the ground organizations, that that work should actually change the way that we do business in philanthropy. My hope is that we become more flexible, we become more responsive to the needs of community, and that we're not necessarily bogging down our nonprofit um, partners with 
you know, uh, obsessive uh, reporting, lack of coordination among the sector. Um, and so I'm hoping that um, this will, will create some, some new level of innovation. Um, and I'm not, I, I'm, we're being pretty innovative right now. So it's, uh, it should change the way we do business in the future. So that's what I'm hoping. Helpful. So Janet put this in the chat. We're in um, close to our last 10 minutes. I would like to turn to the topic of education. Uh, so we at GFE have about 300 members. We've been trying to do our best to track uh, where our members are putting their investments over this uh, crisis period. And we see a real huge focus on basic needs, a much lesser focus on education specifically. Um, Janet put it in the chat box. We'd love to hear from others, but I'd love for um, those of you uh, at Denver and Rose Community just to kind of reflect a little bit about on how you're thinking about this in the short and the long term. Um, so I, just sort of quickly for us, I think we, so in the conversations that we had with the school districts, the sort of the, you know, Celine said there was sort of a more focus on basic sort of needs. When we asked our school district partners, we really tried to say, um, you know, what, what do you need right now? And there were sort of two needs that were identified, the basic needs, food. In, in Denver, it's a lot of um, two things. It's food on the weekends for kids um, that doesn't get reimbursed and also adults connected to kids that, that, that most of all the districts are providing meals for everyone. Yeah. And then the other piece we had in Denver was um, obviously sort of the equity piece regarding technology and, um, and sort of access to either the strength of modems. I mean, we've had some great, you know, Comcast and Infinity have stepped forward, but even, you know, sort of the strength of Wi-Fi and just fit, like actual devices. Um, I would say that my favorite, um, you know, other things that we've heard, you know, one thing I heard the other day from uh, the Denver Public Schools was that, you know, down the road, that they anticipate, so they run after school programming, that's about a $3 million budget, they continued to pay those staff during this time and they're obviously not doing after school and so they're worried there's gonna be a $3 million, you know, at least gap to start the next school year around that. Um, my favorite innovation quickly that I've heard from uh, more than one school district is um, re Remobilizing their transportation staff to do everything from deliver meals to places where people can't get and to literally use the buses to park modems in communities where the Wi Fi doesn't reach. So they're taking like an awesome, powerful modem and parking it in a community that might not have access. And I just, you know, I have just been really inspired by, um, you know, honestly, how every, uh, almost every district, you know, and now is the hard part, the implementation, but I mean, they just all turned on a dime to try to figure out how to how to get this done. So anyway, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Um, Denver Foundation, any thoughts on um, on this question of education uh, versus basic needs and short term, long term? One thing that I love about working with Julie is that, um, you know, and actually with all of our program areas is um, that we've gotten really good at, at cross-pollination, as Julie calls it, and really um, working together. So we don't necessarily see our work as separate. So basic needs is, is, is actually a part of you know, education as well, and we co-invest in, in those ways as well. Um, some of the things, and we also steal Janet's work all the time too. So one of the things I love about our education funder sector is that we don't need multiple folks kind of gathering information. So what she, she has, she shares. What I have, I share. Um, I think in regards to innovation, some of the conversations that I've had have been around trauma informed and trauma sensitive. Um, some communities that are, uh, one of our, our school district partners, um, Sheridan School District is, is a, a, an incredibly vulnerable um, school district. I think they have the last, largest ho uh, homeless population in the state. Um, and one of the conversations that we had this week was around, you know, what are some of the ways in which you could continue doing behavioral health um, and um, trauma and resiliency type work with family. And so they've adopted um, a teletherapy program using a um, secure system called Reconnect that will allow um, our partner, the Juvenile Assessment Center, to continue doing some, um, some uh, 
you know, uh, counseling or mental um, and behavioral health support for families that might be feeling um, uh, traumatized, you know, all of us, I think, are traumatized, but might be experiencing some, some significant trauma around this. Um, that work is also um, coordinating a tremendous amount of community support. So, um, you know, folks in the Sheridan um, corridor are actually um, connecting um, students and families to resources that they might not have necessarily been connected to before. So I think it's really breaking down some of the, um, the silos in communities where race um, and, you know, um, immigration status um, may, have, may have actually isolated state families. I think it's actually starting to come together. So what I hope is that um, in the recovery process that these, these partnerships um, and this new thinking about how communities are coming together collectively, um, regardless of race, ethnicity, background, whatever it may be, uh, I think is going to be exciting. I hope we can use that as a leverage point um, moving forward. That's great. Uh, I do want to draw people's attention to the chat box where there is uh, some other good things that are related to education and mental health supports and uh, supports for healthcare workers, uh, children. So uh, also want to mention that we're, uh, we have about five to seven minutes left. So if you do have a question, make sure to put it in the chat box. Uh, I wanted to turn to the question of making sure that uh, all of the dire needs that exist right now get met without tremendous redundancy. So you all have talked about a variety of different populations. Uh, so from uh, homeless uh, persons, people who are food insecure, immigrants and refugees, older adults, uh, persons of color. Um, these are all different communities. Um, they all have some points of overlap. Um, how are you thinking about uh, making sure that all needs get met without too much redundancy? I'll just say that um, for me, one of my first um, strategies was trying to find the sweet spot for philanthropy in a time where government resources were ebbing and flowing and, and still are, obviously, you know, at local level, state level, federal levels, um, coming from all different sort of sector sources, as well as philanthropic and private sector resources. And being on statewide working groups has been really, really helpful and also really staying very, very closely aligned from the, um, with the emergency response centers. Every state has emergency plans. They, um, things get very local very quickly. Um, they all have EOCs, emergency operations centers that are intended to have um, homeless providers, the feeding providers, the school districts, they're supposed to happen at a local level to deploy and assess what resources are needed, what resources remain unmet. Some of them have unmet needs committees attached to them um, that can really help you discern who's getting resources, who isn't getting resources. It's an imperfect situation, but I find it's the best space to be in to, to see where things are flowing or not flowing is in some of those macro spaces. That makes a ton of sense. That's helpful. Anyone else want to weigh in there? I was, I was also just going to say that, you know, I mean, I think it's, we had a lot of conversations as we were thinking about the groups that we identified and we, we, there was this tension of saying like, we know that, you know, food insecurity and we do a, a huge grant to, you know, Food Bank of the Rockies, which is the group that really gets sort of most of the food out. We know that that will reach as we try to unsilo, how do we unsilo our work, which we're really trying hard to sort of with our new strategic plan. And how, we, how do we also then give specific support to specific, I think, communities of people that we know that we need it and not just say, well, we gave to Food Bank of the Rockies and we know that touches immigrants and refugees. And so I think it's always a tension. I think the other important, I think, tools that we have, um, just two other things that I think are important worth mentioning is we have really created um, for, uh, as we think about reaching all the need you know, a, a really good resource for our donors to be able to push, um, you know, and, and make very visible um, organizations beyond just the ones that we made our initial grant making with that have need. So I think community foundations pushing that to their donors. And then I think, you know, the last thing I'll say is that community foundations can also do use their, you know, policy political muscle. And so, you know, we have been 
And sometimes that's just a tweet weighing in on, you know, amen to Governor Polis making a statement around, you know, DACA students at this moment. And sometimes it's a harder push in terms of a formal, um, you know, political stance in this moment. So I think that's important too, as we think about how do we, you know, none of our philanthropy could reach all the need and how do we also use those big lever tools as well. Yes. All right. I just, so I was going to say one thing. I think like sector overall, um, to Janice's point, I think um, we have I, over the last few weeks have really done a good job of, of um, being in relationship with our donors. Um, and we, we're, we're not necessarily telling our donors where they should, should give, but definitely having more conversations with them about their assets um, and, and ways in which they can, we can influence the way that they give. Um, and so I think that they've really been, and, and to our CEO, Javier Soto, um, talking very passionately and intently about um, ways that we can influence our donors. I think that's, that, that has to be part of this next generation of whatever philanthropy is, that, that we do have the, the, the capacity to um, leverage our resources, not just in our own sort of buckets, but um, more broadly. And so I'm really excited about, about that. So hopefully we can keep the momentum going and that this will definitely begin to change the way that, that community foundations do um, do their work. So that is good. And that it brings me to my last little comment. So these are pretty heavy conversations and I like to end on um, the most positive note we can find. Um, so you all have touched on this notion of de of systems disruptive, of change disruption, of changing the way we do our work. What is your best hope for coming out of this with some lessons learned and some new practices, both across the sector and in how we serve um, the most needy in our population? I think today, this morning, I read um, that um, African Americans, I don't know how I ended up getting on watching, but I ended up watching um, the Alabama governor um, answer a question about the dis uh, disproportionate impact of COVID-19 um, in uh, African-American communities. I think like 40% of the deaths in Alabama have been um, African-American. And I think that like that has to be, we have to be able to open this up in a way that, that sort of shows that communities are not making this up, right? Like that there is um, a system that is oppressive and that vulnerable people overall are gonna be hit hard. And so, you know, it's my best hope that um, we walk away from this um, with more kindness and compassion and a collective spirit that says we're all in this together, that my destiny is connected to your destiny, that we have this shared um, destiny. But I, but I think for me, it's, 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 it's sad, it's heartbreaking that, um, that African-Americans in particular are going to be disproportionately affected by this. And I, I would imagine as we get more data that that's going to become true. So I hope that we learn from this and that we don't go back um, where we were. Anyone else have anything to wrap? I feel like what Clanis has said is sort of the most powerful and important piece of this. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. All right, well then that is the right place to end. Um, and I really appreciate uh, Janet, Julie, and I, I think that we're getting wrapped up. Uh, sorry, so uh, Janet, June, Julie, Kalinas, um, this was a really useful conversation um, and I just really appreciate your time. Thank you so much and thank you to everyone who attended. Bye-bye.